it's such a blessing to be here. It's a little uh, overwhelming, frankly, um, to win an award like that, mainly because it makes me realize, am I that old, really? They're giving me awards now? Yeah, you young people, you laugh. It'll happen to you. It'll happen to all of you. You'll be sorry. Um, I, uh, I'm so excited. First of all, let me tell you something. I'm excited about my friend Matt Bennett and Christian Union, because Christian Union, when I first heard about it, many of you were in diapers, literally. Isn't that embarrassing? Think about that. Uh, and I, I said, having been to Yale and having known that uh, it's a seminary of Satan, I say that in a positive, I say that in a positive way. I say that in a positive way. Now we know, I joke a lot, so don't laugh or you will encourage me. Um, ha having been uh, there, not really as a believer, right? Um, I know how spiritually dark the greatest institutions, all those schools, all your schools can be. And if you don't feel that, Maybe that's a good thing, you know, maybe uh, may maybe things are a little bit better now, literally because of Christian Union, because there's some great stuff happening on these campuses. Uh, but when I was there, it was very spiritually dark, and it wasn't a good place to find Jesus. It doesn't mean there wasn't Christian ministry on campus, but um, part of what I want to talk about tonight, courage, uh, courageous in the ways of the Lord, um, is to think about those people, and this is all, this is basic Christianity, but about, about those who are lost, right? I mean, that's, that's, the Lord is always the advocate of the one who has no voice. Tomorrow morning, you'll hear from uh, Baroness Cox, uh, who is herself a voice for those who don't have a voice around the world, and the Lord always calls us to do that, uh, to love those um, who maybe people don't even know they exist, right? And so whether you're talking about the unborn or you're talking about who, whoever it is, some group of people, and we love to think about groups of people, right? How about if we don't think about groups of people for five seconds and think about people as individuals, okay? Think about the person on your campus. I don't care what color they are or like what sexual stuff they have going on. We're all messed up, broken, sinners, who apart from Jesus deserve to go to hell forever. Amen? Isn't that chipper? Amen? Yeah. Hellbound sinners? Come on. And we're all that, but there are so many on your campuses who do not have the hope you have, and I was one of them. And I think, wow, to, to reach those people with the love of Jesus takes courage. So I want to talk about that a little bit, but... Uh, just a few thoughts on the way. The word courage, some of you are uh, students of uh, language, uh, some of you uh, are students of French. You know, the word courage, the root, I'm a, I was an English major at Yale, which is why it took me 45 years to pay the rent, but I'm just saying, uh, yeah, if you're an English major, mar marry a banker or, do, or, do, or, or switch majors quick because it could be tough, very tough but only for like 30 years, and then it's, it's great. Uh, it flies by, it flies by. Um, but, um, so I was an English major, and, uh, and I love words. And we all know the Lord gives you, he makes you who you are. And I don't know why I love words, I just did. It was in my genes. My great-grandfather was a writer, and he loved words. I actually found a book, he was from Greece. My, my dad's from Greece, my mom's from Germany. And um, th my father showed me a notebook from the 1870s in Greek. The whole thing was in Greek for my great-grandfather. And it was him scribbling down the etymologies of words. And I thought, how freaky that I could get an etymology gene. You're familiar with the Human Genome Project? Even they have not found the etymology gene, gene yet. But they're trying to map it. Uh, so... I love words, and I realized at some point, not many years ago, that the word courage comes from the root cur, okay? So in French, you know, cur is heart. Okay, yeah, you know? All right, take it easy. And, 
And I thought to myself, the cool thing about translation, when you translate scripture, is that we think, I mean, if you're not into etymology or words, you think courage means courage. I know what it means. But it doesn't mean, there's meaning behind the meaning. There's always meaning behind the meaning. And you realize that the word courage is really to have heart. So then you have to define, what, what does that mean? We're not talking about, a, a, you know, a, a, uh, a pumping blood organ in your chest. That's really not what scripture means. The heart is the center, the core, right? It's a metaphor, right? And um, so you think about the word to have courage is to have heart, right? Now, in my seven men book, I talk about what it is to be a man and how we have begun to, uh, for begun to, you know, for like 50 years now, have misdefined, uh, I don't even know if that's a word, but I'm going to go with it, uh, poorly defined what it is to be a man, right? And C.S. Lewis wrote a book, as you know, Men Without Chests. Uh, actually, I don't know, that wasn't a book, that was a chapter in his book, Abolition of Man. But he talks about this concept, right, that the biblical idea to be lion-hearted, okay, now, I know on some level this applies to women, and I'm not going to get into that right now, but I'm, but I'm talking specifically about this biblical idea of, of a lion and this idea of courage, kingly courage, right? Very different from what we say today. Today, we say, like, that dude's got, you know, like, I think south of the border they say, like, cojones or something. I can't remember the term. It's either that or, or fish tacos or something. I don't know, some, some term but what I'm saying is, like, that's how we think today. We were in a very sexualized culture, and we forgot that the seat of courage and guts is right here. You need to understand that's the biblical idea. And, and here's a little hint. If it's the biblical idea, it's true, right? It's not the Christian idea. That's called the true idea. And all non-true ideas are, are bad ideas. They're stupid. Ignore them, Right? So we're talking about what the scripture says and what God says about what it is to be a man or what it is to have courage, to have virtue. It is the heart. The word cur, okay, heart, courage. To t so in the scripture, how many times do we read, take heart and be of good courage? What does that mean, take heart? Do you ever think about that? I'm sure you haven't, except for the English majors. Take heart. What does that mean? It means be strong, take heart, don't be afraid, take heart. Now, this is a very big idea, but I think it's worth unpacking uh, in this way so we understand what we're talking about. Um, we also know when we talk about the heart, uh, when you say lion-hearted, okay, or when you say uh, be, be strong and of good courage. Take heart. Uh, we also use the term encouraged. That's the word. Encouraged. Take heart. Be encouraged. These are all related in their meaning, okay? Uh, and so even to say have guts, guts are a little bit lower. That's kind of in the bowel region. That's your viscera, okay? You didn't expect to get this kind of a lecture, I know. Take heart, that's your chest, that's who you are, okay? It's different from guts or any other term you wanna use. But what's interesting is your heart is also related to love, right? We know we get that. But I don't really mean gushy romantic love, although that's related to it. But it struck me in thinking about this, this scripture, which I think you know is about Jehoshaphat, right? Has that been unpacked? You guys know who Jeho Jehoshaphat is? He was like a rapper in the 80s. You're too young. You don't know that. But um, Jehoshaphat was courageous in the ways of the Lord. He was someone who had heart. And so you think about what does it mean to be courageous? Usually, in my mind, you can be courageous when you love, right? So we talk about Jesus on the cross, he, he was the most courageous man who ever lived to do what he did. Now, even what he did in, in the natural, we say, well, he suffered and he died. But we all understand it was way more than that. It was a mythical suffering. 
it was an eternal kind of suffering. He suffered what he suffered on the cross outside of time and before time, as well as historically on the cross. To do that, to die and to suffer for all of mankind, so that to me, that takes courage, right? So we're not talking about gentle Jesus, meek and mild. We're talking about a man of such courage, we can't begin to comprehend how he did that. And yet, if we want to know how he did it or why he did it, he did it because he loved us. So to have that kind of courage to do the right thing when anything else would be easier becomes easy when you love. If the love is real, you're willing to do it. Now, I, as, as a parent get that on a level that if, if you're not a parent, I don't think you can get that. And I'm not trying to put you down because you're uh, students. Actually, I am. Actually, I am. Um, no. But the point is, like, when, when Suzanne and I, when our daughter was born, who, by the way, is uh, a sophomore at an unnamed college uh, right now, and she... Uh, I keep trying to explain to her that the love that I felt when you came into this world, I'd never experienced anything like that before. And I think God gives us these glimpses in the natural to teach us about himself. And I just thought, oh my gosh, the love that I feel for this creature is so overwhelming, I would do anything. I have no fear because of the love that I have for this kid. If I could do anything for her, I would, I would suffer a thousand tortures and deaths, like, with joy. And you think, well, you know, in some ways, that, that's nuts. What's that? What is that? Well, that's God. That's God puts that in us. When you love, you have that kind of courage. You've heard stories, right, of, of mothers and fathers running out and, you know, saving their kids and having... There's something powerful. And so those of you who have parents who don't sufficiently appreciate them, I want you to think about that. It's an amazing thing, and probably until you have kids, you won't get it, and then you'll get it, and you'll be as embarrassed as I was when my daughter was born. You're like, oh, if my parents loved me like a little bit like this, I am so embarrassed right now, because you can't really reciprocate it until you get it. But that love that the Lord had for us on the cross, and that a lot of us feel sometimes for others, is so powerful when it's real that you'll do anything. You don't fear anything. And I think we all know it's because at the heart of reality and truth it is this thing, the agape love of Jesus, and that when we taste it, it gives us courage to do what is right. It's just the way the Lord created things. And so it gives us what we call a boldness, right? Uh, when you love uh, someone the way uh, William Wilberforce loved the African slaves. He said, I don't care about my political career. I don't care about anything. I care. I want to do anything I can for them. I will do anything for them. I will suffer years of, of uh, struggle, horrible struggle that I don't need to go through, except I choose to go through it because God has given me a heart for them. This is the agape love of God. You see it over and over and over again. It gives us courage. And it's always about somebody else, right? It's never about us. That's by definition, the agape love of God is a self-giving love. So if we get all obsessed about our own quiet times and our own walk with the Lord and our own this and our own that, we are making it impossible for the Lord to work through us, right? Because it has to be about how can I bless someone else? And it's going to be different. We're all called to different things and to different people. And the Lord might call you to minister to someone on your campus. We, we don't know. Like the Holy Spirit moves as he lists. I love that translation. Anybody know what I'm talking about? No? What are you reading? NIV? Come on. That's King James. Look, if the King James was good enough for Paul, it should be good enough for you punks in the Ivy League. All right? Come on. Everybody knows King James. That's what Paul read in his day. Uh, so, yeah, oh yeah, look it up, look it up. So, uh, what was I talking about? 
Honey, can you help me? Hold up a flashcard or something. I'm lost. Um, so, unbelievable. So, the Lord calls each of us individually to love different things and different causes and different people. So, for Wilberforce, it was the African slaves, right? Uh, I wrote a book about Wilberforce called Amazing Grace. I wrote a book about Bonhoeffer called Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophets. By both of these are stories uh, of, of men of amazing courage, but it was for others. And that's really what gives us the courage. That's the magic. You can't really have that courage for yourself. It's very hard to have that for yourself. You, I think you can't in a way. Uh, it's got to be for the Lord or for someone else. But um, I say those things. I want to. I want to break it down real quick because I, I, I'm talking about love and courage. But part of what it means to be courageous is to be bold. We know that part of it, right? And a lot of times when I've spoken about Bonhoeffer, now I don't assume you all know the, the story of Bonhoeffer. The, the super nutshell version is he was a German pastor who got involved in the plot against Adolf Hitler. And I was like, I guess 24, maybe it was right around my 25th birthday, as I was thinking about this God thing in my misery because I graduated Yale and, and just was lost. I was just drifting and floating. And by the way, if you graduate and you drift and float, you know what will happen, right? You will move back in with your parents. Yeah, I just want you to. That's like math. That's like an axiom. That's going to happen. So you got to better know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're going back. Uh, so I always I always joke around because like if your parents are, are like normal American parents, they're like, well, it's great. You know, Eric's finding himself or whatever. But in my case, my parents were European immigrants, so their attitude was like, Eric, you need to find yourself a job. You need to get out. You need to get out. Like we work menial jobs so you could like go to that. Like school, we didn't get to go to college, right? So if you don't mind, get a job. Um, so it was kind of a harsh time for me. And, uh, but I was, um, I, was, I was lost. I was lost. But I want to come back to boldness before I get into that. The, bold, the issue of boldness, to be bold for Christ, to be bold in your faith, that's part of courage, right? There are two issues, uh, and I always bring this back to Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, whom I just mentioned, right, was the German pastor who got involved in the plot against Hitler, okay, and who had courage and love for the Jews and therefore had no fear of the Nazis and went to his death in 1945 because his attitude, as our attitude must be, is I just want to do what the Lord wants. And the Lord, when the Lord shows you clearly right and wrong, unless you're a fool, you just do what the Lord shows you because you know that anything else is foolishness and will end tragically and painfully. So he, he follows the Lord in this, and it's a long story, but the, but the bottom line is it was his love for God's people, the Jews, that gave him this amazing courage to do what he did. But a lot of times, I've given so many talks on Bonhoeffer, people have asked me, like, what do you think gave him the courage that he had? What do you think? And I thought, you know, it's interesting. There's no doubt that it was his faith. And you, you begin to understand how all these things melt together, right? Because you're talking about love, you're talking about, we know we can't have the agape love of God apart from the Holy Spirit, right? You just can't, otherwise, you, you know, you're kidding yourself. And so... That, even if you're not aware it's the Holy Spirit, if, if you, even if you're not a Christian, that love is, that's God is the author of that love. But faith is involved too, right? That you know the Lord is in this. You know right from wrong. And Bonhoeffer is one of these geniuses who knew what he knew so clearly that there was no alternative. If you know the Lord and you know what the scripture says and you know what is true, it's kind of hard to screw up. Kind of like when you get to heaven, you're not going to really screw up that much. You, you could have laughed at that because people don't screw up in heaven. Like, you know that, right? You guys, you should know that. Like, there's not a lot of sin in heaven. You didn't know that? Matt, wh why am I? Like, they need to know that first before I, I talk. So think about this for a second, right? Where there's a lot of faith, and when you get to heaven, it's pure faith. You're going to know the stuff that you kind of hope or might know now, you're going to know, right? When you know what is true, when you know the Lord, 
it, it, it's natural to do the right thing. It's natural. It, you, you can't, almost can't not do it. So I talk about Bonhoeffer as an example of someone who, he knew the Lord. And so people say, it's amazing that he went to the gallows, that he faced death so bravely. And you think, yeah, but it's the Lord's will that we know him so well that that's not so difficult. That's the Lord's will. The Lord doesn't want us to be in a position where somebody has to say, dude, you need to suck it up. Come on, be brave. He doesn't want us to need that. He wants us to just be brave because we know him. We don't have any doubt. We're not like, uh, I hope this is right. And that kind of gives you boldness. It gives you courage. And I, I just called it faith, right? But I want to break that down further and say that you can get that two ways, right? You know, in, a, in a way, it all comes from the Holy Spirit, so we, we know that. But you can get it through reason and revelation, right? Reason and revelation, what I mean is we live in a culture, and you all know this, that makes it sound like faith is apart from science and somehow never the twain shall meet or whatever. But we know the reality is the Lord invented the universe, pretty big uh, thing, and he invented reality and atomic structure, and there's probably like 100 billion layers below atomic structure, and he invented it all, and he's the author of all of it. And so the idea that uh, science or anything could like disprove God ultimately is laughable. I don't have time to break that down for you, but I've written about it in my Miracles book and stuff. It's like the more you know about the universe and about science or whatever, the more strong your faith becomes, unless you want tenure. And then you hide that stuff. You hide that. You shut up and hide it until you get tenure. And then you let them have it. So, so the fact is, the more science we know as believers, and the more time passes, the more bold we are in our faith. Because we're like, this is, if it was 1880, like, you'd be like, well, I don't know, the fossil record as the years go by, may prove that, uh, probably will prove that evolution happened, and then what do I do, and I don't know. And I, Okay, well, it didn't show that. Like 120 years later, uh, 140 years later, it, it didn't show that. The more science reveals, the easier it is to believe whatever the scripture teaches. The, the archaeology, like every year I read something in the New York Times, like they discovered this, they discovered this. Archaeology more and more proves what the scripture says, like it's getting funny, okay? In the 1870s, they were saying like, you know, the scripture's all myth, like science is gonna disprove it. it where are the Hittites, by the way? Like, where, where, where are these groups? This is all made up stuff, right? Well, in the 1870s, a dude like discovered the Hittite civilization, dropped the mic and walked off stage. It was like unbelievable. But this keeps happening through history, especially in the last 150 years. More and more science and archeology span and everything shows that what we believe, despite what the mainstream culture might say, it's just, it's just true. And the more you know, the more you, you have less fear, like, oh, what are my friends gonna think? What are your friends gonna think? Like, you believe one and one equals two. Like, if your friends have a problem with that, that's gonna be their problem. Like, this is just real. So you don't wanna be boastful, but you, you need to not shrink from representing what is true. What we believe is true. And I think a lot of times we have this attitude like, but Christians should be humble and apologetic kind of. Like, we don't want to be boastful. Well, no, uh, but there are times when uh, it's almost weird not to be boastful, right? I mean, if you're eight feet tall and somebody's making fun of you for being short, you know, you need to let them understand, like, dude, I, I don't know where you're coming from, but I'm eight feet tall. And when it comes to what we believe, I sometimes feel that way. Like people act like, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to act like I'm eight feet tall, e even though I am. Like, I don't, don't want to, that would be like rude. What you believe actually is true. It's not your opinion. It's not Christian truth. There's no Christian truth. There's either truth or there's no truth. Okay? That's right. And I will. And I'm telling you, we have to get outside of that mindset that we've got this weird little understanding of things and we just want to share it with you. Like, what? It's like if somebody's drowning, it's like saying, I hope you don't mind, like if I share a rope, like would that offend you? 
I don't want to, should I toss you the rope or would you be triggered and you'd really rather drown? You'd rather drown, I know you'd rather drown. I'm, so, I'm sorry for saving you from drowning. That's where we are, folks. People are drowning and we're kind of acting like, I don't know if I want to share that rope with them because drowning is kind of cool now, right? Like, I don't know. So what we have is the answer to the mystery and questions of every human heart. Now, here's the issue. We need to know that. Otherwise, you're not going to present it that way. You need to understand that on your campuses, the people who are not interested in you, like who just like leave me alone with your weird stuff, like I was one of those people, and I wanted nothing more than that weird stuff. But people put up shells, or they put up this, or put up that. So you need to approach them like you're approaching like a messed up, like homeless person that, that doesn't know that, that they need shelter and whatever. Like you need to have the kind of love that says, look, even if you don't know, I know, and if I can come alongside you, I would love to bless you, I'd love to help you. And if you don't want me to now, I'll come back tomorrow, it's okay. Because I know you shouldn't be on the streets, I know you shouldn't be hungry, and I, I would love to, to do something for you. There are people walking around everywhere, but on your campuses, like me, back when I was your age, who I didn't know what I didn't know, I didn't know that you could know what you know and I know now, that the stuff that we know, I was sure no one could know. I was sure even if it were true, and I didn't know if it was, but even if it were, you couldn't know because it was one of those things nobody could know. And now I realize I could know and I know. And I love the fact that the one time I'm getting really serious, you're chuckling, that's great. So, So I was so unable to see those things, and I, and I think to myself, what did the Christian faith on my campus at that time look like? And I think a lot of the believers at the time, were they were a little intimidated and a little weirded out that somebody might get offended if they share their faith or something like that. And I think, you know what, maybe there are some people like that, but who cares about those people? Let me tell you, for every one of them, there's somebody else dying for what you have and are maybe afraid to share. They're dying for it. And if you don't give it to them, if you don't share it to them, I'm telling you, they're going to suffer. They're going to suffer. So now we get to the love part. If you love them or if the Lord gives you love for them, you're willing to take a little guff because you love them. You're willing to be put off a little bit if you love them because you know the Lord loves them. And so to my mind, we need to know that what we say is true and what we believe is not just totally true. It's truth itself. It's the greatest thing imaginable. And there is not a soul who's ever existed who doesn't long for it, even if they don't know it, even if they say that they hate it because they're made by the God who made them to long for that. They cannot escape it. They cannot escape it. So we're talking about knowing these things so that we can love those that the Lord loves, that we can have courage as we walk through this life, which is going to tell a lot of us that our beliefs are offensive and this and that. And you know what? Again, that's fine. That's fine. But I care more about the person than about having them kind of, you know, attack me by saying that that's offensive. And I, I think, again, if your spirit is right, now if you're, if you're an offensive person, because we know there have always been Christians that have been themselves offensive, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about the offense of the gospel and the offense of love. Because love scares people because they can see that, well, if that's real, I don't know if I want to deal with that. But the Lord calls us to live that way. That's what it is to be courageous in the Lord, to know these things, to know that these people are dying to have what you have and probably take for granted largely. They're dying for that. 
And I was one of those people. So I can speak from that, from that place. And I think when Wilberforce thought of the African slaves that he was working for in Parliament, um, he went through hell. But he didn't care because he said, I'm doing it for them. The Lord has called me to help them. And because of his love for them, he didn't care if it was tough. He, his battle was the Lord's battle. He got that. The Lord had called him to this. The Lord gave him the courage and the heart and the faith and whatever he needed to do what he needed to do. And by the way, Wilberforce had a lot of love. He was not, I mean, I think of the pro-life issue today, which is close to my heart and my wife's heart. If you really love the unborn, then you will love their mothers and you will love Anybody invite doesn't mean sometimes you don't get in the flesh and you get but the point is that love makes it possible for you to represent what you know is true when people are just saying shut up you need to shut up I don't want to hear it I don't want to hear it I don't want to hear it well on some level they really do want to hear it but we have to think how can I represent it in a loving way Wilberforce managed to represent what he represented in a way that was loving many people still hated him but there are many people on the fence who said wow this guy is not a moralist he really there's something different there it's almost like God really is with him which is scary and compelling I say the same thing about Bonhoeffer he loved the Jews so he didn't care that many of his friends said to him what are you doing getting involved in all this political stuff why don't you just pray? Why don't you just have your quiet time? Why don't you just share Jesus with people? Why do you have to get political? He's like, why do I have to get political? Because they're killing Jews, and I believe God will judge me for doing nothing about that. And will I get to heaven by grace? Yes. I Saving Jews is not going to get me into heaven. But... The Lord already 2,000 years ago did what it takes to get me into heaven. And now I'm on my own. He lets me do what I want. And am I just going to like pray quietly so I don't screw anything up? Or am I going to be bold and do what I think he's calling me to do? The reason he saved me was that I could save others, that I could act, I could do things. Not just to be a pious Christian. If prayer doesn't lead to some kind of action... You know, you have to say, are you really, are, are you missing those people? Do you not love them? Are you really not doing anything? You don't, you don't feel moved to save the, the Jews that are, because it, it, it's kind of uncool with your friends who think you're, you've gotten political? See, that's where you have to decide, am I going to be a man or a woman of courage? Am I going to do what I think the Lord's calling me to do or, or not? Because at the end of the day, the Lord is going to be the judge of whether you made an idol of politics or you were using politics to do the Lord's will. The Lord's going to be the judge of that. Not people on the left or the right who just don't get it. So to be courageous ultimately means to have a kind of relationship with Jesus where you know he is your judge. And you're not worried about the other judges. Now, again, I'm not talking about a religious, to being a religious nut, but I'm talking about you, you answer to an audience of one. And you have to do what he calls you to do. And where you are now in, uh, in school, uh, I just want to say again, the idea that you all are there uh, representing Jesus uh, thrills me. I cannot tell you how it thrills me. Um, and I know it's not easy, but I want you to know the Lord is with you. The Lord wants you to have courage for his purposes because he has souls out there, people out there who are dying for what you have. Don't let them fool you. They're dying to know what you know. And if you really love them, you won't care about whether you get credit. You might just be a path, a part of the path. I remember um, I sort of fell away from faith 
right around college. It was, I was confused, and I sort of fell away. And I remember I was living in Boston, and I was riding the T, and a dude sees me, and he says, Eric, remember me? I'm so-and-so from InterVarsity at Yale. Remember, remember? It's like three years ago, like I had attended a little InterVarsity at Yale, and then I kind of blew it off. And uh, I remember him kind of approaching me like, hey, a bunch of us, you know, Christians, we're hanging out. We're having a barbecue tomorrow, and you should come. You should hang out. And I remember that feeling of like, no. <laughs> I don't want to hang out with you people. I'm fine. I'm totally fine. Well, you know what C.S. Lewis says, right? That the Lord says, the Lord wants us to say to him, thy will be done. But at some point, he will say to us, okay, thy will be done. And he lets us go so that we can see what it is when our will is done and not his. And that's what happened to me. And only by his grace, uh, he came back into my life and saved me dramatically. But I remember that feeling of like, I'm cool, leave me alone. Like, I don't wanna hang out with you Christians, I'm good. I'm hanging out with the literary crowd. Yeah, I might get a tattoo. <laughs> and I think to myself, wow, looking back now at the person who is saying like, I'm fine, it just cracks me up because now I know, wow, I was not fine. I was not fine. And I wonder if someone else had reached out to me and someone else had reached out to me. Who knows? These things are in God's economy. We can never figure it out. But I just want to scatter these random thoughts with you because I know where many of you are right now. Uh, you know, it's funny. Matt uh, wanted me to talk on this, Matt, uh, and I... I had planned uh, to talk, the title of my talk was uh, King Cyrus as a Type and Shadow of President Trump. And I decided, <laughs> what? I, I decided probably that was like political and I would not talk about that. Um, what about King Jong-un as a Latter-day Sennacherib? Would, would that have gone over? You probably haven't heard of Sennacherib, right? You need to get in the word. Um, <laughs> I wanted to end with some dumb jokes and then pray for you guys. Uh, really, I'm so blessed to be here. I'm so honored, Matt, that you would, um, uh, that you would uh, give me that award. Uh, tomorrow morning, you're going to hear from a real hero of the faith, Baroness Cox, who's become a friend and who is somebody that has been um, a hero in the way that I'm talking about. And you'll hear her story. Uh, and I, uh, I want to mention that because I want you to know that there's room for millions of heroes like Baroness Cox in this world. And if you let the Lord use you that way, the world would be so dramatically different when you're my age and standing up here. It will be a dramatically different world. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I lift up these students. Lord, I know how much you love them because how much I love my daughter, Lord. You love them with a love that is beyond their imagination, and I speak courage over them, and life over them, and faith over them, and a boldness over them that they would laugh at the idea that you might not be who you say you are, that it might not all be true, that they would so experience you and know you that people would see you when they see them. Anoint them now for your service, Lord God, in their generation, that they would never, ever shrink from your touch on their lives, but would embrace it and would soar from glory to glory till they see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm.